identity crisis. Uh, uh, I grew up in Hong Kong and I travel with a Chinese passport, but I work in an American university and then because of my often quite uh, uh, provocative and critical view on Chinese development, um, and sometimes my colleagues will think that actually I'm a kind of a banana spokesperson <laughs> of the goddamn American imperialism, uh, even the China basher. Uh, but uh, recently, that uh, um, 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 quite well known, but also sometimes lousy uh, Marxist political uh, geographer in Britain uh, came to my rescue to certify my Chinese patrioticism by the, uh, writing an editorial in one of the journals that he found, which is political geography, and critiquing me uh, as a kind of exemplary spokesperson of Chinese imperialism. Uh, but it is quite interesting, and it is uh, actually fit in what I want to talk about, that is the, the impact of the rise of China on the global south in general, and Asia in particular. Uh, because the context is that like uh, two or three years ago, I published an article in the Liu Lab Review magazine uh, critiquing the Chinese uh, export-oriented development model that uh, rose in the 1990s and consolidated after China's uh, uh, accession uh, into the WTO. Uh, I will get back to it later, but uh, I'm criticizing this model, and this model is uh, built upon the, the uh, uh, the, the sacrifice of many peasants workers uh, in China and the environment and also um, it is actually part of the neoliberal global order centered in the US and as you know the story is very uh, well known that uh, China has been buying all these useless US treasury bonds to finance uh, Americans uh, 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 big spender types of consumerism. Now the EU is in crisis, they are asking for China to rescue them and uh, so it is not good for, for China, and it is not particularly good for the Global South as well, I'll come back to it later. Uh, but I also point out that after 2005, uh, the Chinese government has uh, taken a number of uh, sensible and good steps uh, to move away from this export-oriented uh, model of uh, development, um, and to shift to a more uh, domestic private consumption uh, the model of growth, and, and I argue that if this kind of uh, shifting continue to deepen and even accelerate in the future, then China will have the potential to become a leader of the global south and uh, uh, in, in, in increase the kind of south-south economic and even political cooperation and then challenge the neoliberal uh, the global order. You feel fast. Slow down, yeah. Uh, to challenge the neoliberal uh, global order uh, centered uh, in the US and then I think that uh, it is already happening that uh, provided with the global financial crisis uh, in the US and then the EU but my position that China's potential to become a leader of the global south is uh, actually uh, taken on by that uh, lousy Marxist political geographer from Britain and then I take the time to copy his uh, 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 critique here uh, and I even, but uh, the title of his, uh, let me skip all this first, uh, uh, of the article is too offensive and provocative that I don't even dare to put it here. The, uh, uh, the article title is that like how communist China make use of capitalist globalization to create the last great modern imperialism in the world. That, that is outrageous and there's a lot of problem in the article. but. Uh, his point is that the most studies of the economic rise of China have focused upon uh, East West shift, particularly this tendency. Okay. Uh, so I'm just reading this paragraph, so I make it easier to translate this. So most studies of the economic rise of China have focused upon these U.S. shifts, particularly in terms of the interdependencies between Chinese production and U.S. consumption, and in their search for new progressive Chinese policies. Such studies, which is exactly my studies, playing on the idea that the PRC maintains the potential for leadership of the South against the rich bloc through mutually beneficial South-South economic relations that fit uh, the theme of our conference very well. Uh, that home is myself, and then the analysis presented above that is uh, Peter Taylor home analysis that actually he argued that uh, China is becoming a new law uh, to export the South, and uh, 
rather than uh, becoming a leader of the South, though he think that this kind of uh, China as a leader of South-South relation uh, is a wishful thinking to be uh, a contemporary nostalgic fantasy. Uh, uh, by repositioning the state in the world economy through creating a new imperialism, uh, the Chinese leadership has announced the intent destination to be a core location that I look in the Chinese official document, I never see any real announcement by the Chinese leadership that they intend to become a global of love. <laughs> um, so it is a uh, very wrong-headed uh, analysis that uh, if you look at the problems that China is facing, uh, it is uh, very typical of the problems that are uh, shared by many uh, countries from the global south rather than uh, problem facing the global law. As you know that the problem of the global law nowadays is that they are heavily indebted and, uh, consume too much and things like that. So, so China definitely is part of the global south and continue to be part of the global south. Uh, and of course, that uh, the, this uh, scholars from Britain that he is not particularly well positioned to make this acquisition of China becoming a new imperialist uh, because uh, of uh, his uh, uh, ancestor uh, participation or at least complicity uh, in the old British imperialism as professor. The well point out uh, uh, in the, the, the strategy in the, the summer palace in Beijing, the looting and all this stuff. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we should take this kind of criticism lightly, uh, because uh, actually that uh, over the years I uh, uh, mostly uh, during COVID break of conferences I talked to uh, economists and, and and some progressive scholars from uh, from uh, from the global south that they sometimes uh, kind of share this kind of sentiment. Um, for example, one of my friends from the Philippines that I'm sure that many of you know that uh, I agree with him and disagree with him a lot of things. But every time I debate with him, I learn a lot. That is uh, Warren Bell, that he has a good track record of anti-American imperialism. Um, uh, but at the same time, recently, and as you know that he is elected to be uh, the congressman in the Philippines, and he is uh, taking on a kind of a more and more critical uh, view on the China development, and uh, also he is also involved. Uh, uh, he is also involved in the. Sorry, it's so messy. This one. Uh, he's also involved in the kind of South China Sea dispute uh, because of his alliance with the presidents uh, of the Philippines. But it is another issue that, um, and and uh, it, it, this criticism, if you look into the data uh, of Chinese economic development and its impact on the, the global South, that it is uh, indefensible and it is uh, uh, groundless. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, we need to take it seriously. Uh, not particularly that it is from kind of a Marxist school, but also it is uh, somehow shared by some uh, 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 scholars and economists, not all of them, but many of them uh, in, in, in global South. For example, we see the geopolitical development in, uh, in, in Asia. We see that, for example, Myanmar, who has been uh, quite a good relation with China and benefit a lot economically from their trade and uh, economic cooperation with China, uh, seems to be uh, moving toward uh, trying to bring back the, the U.S. and establish an alliance with the U.S. Uh, to kind of counterbalance uh, China influence. And in Africa, we see some uh, recent election in some in, uh, cases in which uh, uh, candidates who run on a kind of a uh, lot particular friendly to China platform uh, won election. Um, and, and Vietnam as well, of course, that uh, there's a joint military exercise between Vietnam and U.S. Uh, last summer. Uh, so it has something to do with uh, this kind of anxiety about the rise of China in the global south and in Asia. Uh, um, of course, the uh, U.S. has some responsibility by the, to uh, kind of uh, help uh, uh, the creating this anxiety and exploiting this anxiety to uh, feed its own to political ends. But also this anxiety in the global south and in Asia uh, has some economic foundation that I think uh, uh, Chinese governments uh, have been doing to try to uh, tackle this. Uh, but there's still some more work to do to check to this. And because of the last 10 years, the Chinese development is export-oriented and it relies on the global law, particularly the US. 
and you as the market while it uh, import a lot of raw materials and uh, components uh, from um, other parts of the global south and of course it create uh, uh, a lot of good impacts for example in Africa I uh, was in a conference about China rising in Bristol two weeks ago there's a scholar from Britain who used to be working very closely with the aid sectors, that is uh, organization like Oxfam and uh, this kind of organization. And he is disappointed by this organization because this organization uh, talk about anti-poverty in Africa, but what he sees nowadays is that when China go there to this low nonsense trade and investment deal and then uh, uh, the Chinese investment in, in Africa basically achieved uh, in five less than five weeks what this organization from the global law of try to achieve but couldn't quite do it uh, in the last 20, 30 years, that is to raise the living standards of uh, many local people and things like that. And um, so it is the positive part and it also of course uh, um, uh, we can observe a similar thing in a larger extent in Cambodia, in Laos and many war torn uh, countries in Asia. But at the same time there is uh, also kind of a concern, uh, or it can lead to a kind of concern that because many uh, this trade and development uh, uh, of China with this uh, the purpose of uh, partner um, is uh, uh, driven by the raw material exports of these countries. And then uh, uh, as uh, you know that after the Second World War, after independence, many of these countries are struggling to get away from the raw material export economy to diversify the economy to move to uh, 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 consumer goods manufacturing and for example South Africa uh, uh, post Arbahead, South Africa tried uh, at some point uh, tried to uh, take on a kind of a East Asian path of export oriented uh, manufacturing but uh, didn't quite work out very well and then now its economy is still quite dependent on uh, uh, raw material export uh, so this kind of a uh, uh, production network is uh, uh, is kind of reinforcing this raw material export dependence of some purpose of countries. So my argument is that uh, the shifting of uh, uh, I'm concluding by way of concluding that the shifting of uh, the export oriented uh, development uh, model of China to a more uh, uh, consumption driven con uh, mode of development is not only good and important. Uh, for the long-term sustainability of Chinese development and the social stability and the living uh, standard improvement of the present markets in China, but it is also very important in making uh, China growth uh, even more uh, beneficial uh, to other global South countries because then China will not only become a big market for raw materials from these global South countries, <laughs> but also become uh, a big market for the manufactured products and other products, other types of products from the global south country. Uh, and uh, as I missed the golden opportunity this time to visit Chongqing, and uh, many of you must have gone there and then impressed by the development there. And many people think that uh, China did uh, already to start to uh, make this shift, uh, and Chongqing model is a right side model of the development to signal the shift. So I hope that this shift can continue to deepen and accelerate it. And in this, when it happens, this kind of a doubt or anxiety about the possible uh, or actual negative impact of the rise of China on the other part of the global south uh, will decrease in the years to come. Thank you.